Last month, I was awarded an honorary degree at the commencement for Tennessee State University. I use it as an opportunity to say thank you to dozens of historically black colleges and universities that have given so much to the community. But I want to go further back, back to February 2017 when President Trump met with over 60 HBCU leaders in the Oval Office. Trump then even signed an executive order increasing federal funding for those schools, saying the move would be, quote, an absolute priority for the White House, end quote. Now, over two years later, several HBCUs are still struggling with funding, low enrollment numbers, and some are even at risk of their uh, losing the cre their accreditation. Joining me now is Glenda Glover, president of Tennessee State University. She's also one of the college leaders who was in the meeting with the president uh, at the occasion I mentioned. Uh, Miss uh, uh, Dr. Glover, let me say this. The first responsibility of a president of a college is to keep it functioning and keep it funded. So I'm not going to ask you to become a political analyst or critic of the president or anybody else. But give me a status of where HBCUs are now uh, in uh, the, this particular time in 2019 after we were told it would be a priority in the country. Have you seen across the board? I know Tennessee State appeared to be uh, uh, functioning very well under your leadership, but HBCUs in general, what are the state of affairs? Thank you, Reverend Sharpton, and thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion. Uh, yes, we did meet in 2017 at the White House. Uh, since that time, you know, a lot of emphasis has been placed on the president, a lot of emphasis placed on, on the White House, but we are the HBCU presidents generally meet with members of Congress. We know that's what a budget is. The Congress has a responsibility for getting the budget done. So many of us have formed our own individual relationship with member, members of Congress. We meet with the Congressional Black Caucus. We meet with the various departments, a Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy. So we've gone a route whereby the model is not so much to depend on what's happening at the White House, but more about how we can set up relationships and partnerships with the various departments and then go from there and use our allies with UNCF, with Thurgood Marshall College Fund, with NAFIO to work with us as we move forward with the administration. Now, has there been a, a very serious increase in, in funds? I know there's a lot of attention. What Robert Smith did was uh, absolutely put it front and center. In another way, uh, the billionaire who gave, uh, who said he was going to pay the student debts at Morehouse. But have you seen as much as you'd like to see in terms of increase in resources through all the various meetings and alliances that you're saying is being made? Well, there's not a, there has been some increases, but there more can be done, and we're looking for more and more to be done. Uh, but we're not just depending on the federal level. We have the state level. We have our alumni. We have the corporations and partnership and, and that we're forming partnerships and collaborations with. We're looking at various other revenue enhancement sources. For example, at Tennessee State University, uh, companies that are moving to Nashville, like Amazon and like and Apple and the various financial institutions, uh, Fifth Third Bank, Regions Bank, Pinnacle Bank, where I sit on the board of directors, we're making public-private partnerships, meeting with them to ensure that we can develop a sustainability model that will keep us going despite the fact that the federal funding may not be where it needs to be. Now, for people that don't know, why are historic black colleges necessary? What role do they play and what do they do that is distinct and unique that uh, you will not get at other institutions? Well, historically, black college universities were established after the Civil War to educate the newly freed slaves. And from there, many schools have gotten started, and we've grown and survived and thrived. And this company would not, this country could not achieve its mission without the contributions of HBCUs. Well, we're only 4% of all the colleges and universities in the country. However, we educate and graduate 21% of the students. Wow. So we, we're number one uh, in, in graduate, well, 40% of the students that graduate in STEM fields go to HBCUs, and 42% at the graduate level, 
50% of educators, 60% of those in, in healthcare fields. So our contributions are, are there, and we're significant with our contributions, and we don't shy away from it. Our, only, our main problem is that we have to spend the first part of every conversation justifying who we are, defending why we exist, and, and trying to determine, make others see the value of HBCUs. Now, no other institution has to do that but HBCUs. <laughs> it's unfortunate that we have to do it that way, but that's where we are in America. You serve also as international president of Alpha Kappa, uh, Kappa Alpha Sorority. Tell us more about how you have made sustaining HBCUs a priority of your administration as the president of this outstanding sorority. Well, thank you. Well, I, as president of AKA, I see for well, Tennessee State first, I see firsthand the financial needs of students, of the institutions. And so I was compelled as president to make one of the program targets how to ensure sustainability of HBCUs. They need funding, they need top quality students to attend HBCUs. That being the case, we made sure that on HBCU day in October, we declared a day when we would raise money for HBCUs, and we raised $1.3 million in that one day just from the membership alone. Mm. And fast forward to, to Black History Month, we gave out $50,000 $50, to one-third of the four-year black colleges because we want to make sure that the sustainability model is in place. That's $1.6 million that we gave to HBCUs on the chart to give our $10 million, to raise and distribute $10 million to start an endowment at each four-year HBCU, so the endowments represent sustainability, and that's our call to action, the HBCU for life, a call to action. And that's black women standing up, people talk about do for self, well, you couldn't get a better example than what the AKs is doing for HBCUs. Glenda Glover, president of Tennessee State, I thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up, my final thoughts.